Hello, everyone. So I'm really excited. I get to drink my wine at the time of this recording. It's 4.09 p.m. Eastern. And for my guest, Derek, it's 3 p.m. So he's going to know Canadians as alcoholics. But anyway, <laughs> whatever, I assume it. I don't drink that much. This is kind of it usually for one night or maybe more. So welcome, Derek. You're joining us from beautiful Wisconsin. Um, I've been there once. And could you tell us maybe where you're from in Wisconsin? Because it is a fairly large territory. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, if you ever looked at the state of Wisconsin, I'm, I'm just about dead center in the state. Uh, most people, when they hear about Wisconsin, think of the Green Bay Packers football team. Yeah, we're about an hour, hour and fifteen minutes west of there. Um, but lived here my whole life, and and you and I were were joking a little bit before uh, we started recording here that. Um, I, I should maybe go grab my bottle of bourbon and we could make this a real party. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> let's, but... stay, let's stay with business. And I know you have <laughs> some exciting stuff for our guests today. Uh, for those tuning in while jogging or something, you'll have to reference the episode and stay till the end because Derek has a, a surprise, a freebie, and I'm all about free. So <laughs> anyway... Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited, Derek. I know you have quite a bit of experience as a real estate investor and also as a lender as well, which is interesting. More and more of my friends, as they grow and evolve as investors, they turn to private lending and need places to park their money. So maybe you could tell us more about your, your background and your experience. Yeah. Um, the, the short version of a long story is, is I started in, in 2003. And like most people, I just started buying older properties and fixing them up, holding them as, as rental cash flowing properties. At the same time, my wife and I had been introduced to a, a couple of opportunities in the state of Florida. And so from about 2003 through 2007, um, we had, you know, we were both working full-time jobs and, and growing our portfolio um, using bank financing. And <clears throat> We ended up, you know, 2007 was was pretty devastating for us. Um, that's yeah. putting, it, putting it mildly, but um, we we found out how little control we actually had over our business. The the banks, in our case, and, and in the lenders, in in almost every case, really have the most control over any real estate deal. So. If I fast forward a lot of, you know, the, the heartache and the, the stuff that we went through um, through about 2010 or 2011, it, it, it led us down a path where we either had to get creative or we had to quit. OK, well, wow. you know, so we were we did end up losing the majority of our portfolio. We, we ended up financially uh, devastated. Our, our credit scores were in the toilet. And, um, but we just didn't believe in, in quitting. When I met my current business partner, um, which was in about 2012, thir 2013, it was interesting that he had never used a bank for any real estate transaction. Oh my. Other than his personal residence. And we, we connected very quickly just from a intellectual and, and, you know, the, the, the conversation flowed very easily between us. And it was a few months later that we we started our first company together. And I remember Jeff is his name. I remember Jeff um, pointing out that he had always raised private money and he had done some lending um, just on a side, you know, a, a few loans here and there. Casually. Casually. And, you know, my my focus when I was getting into the business was what many people are taught, whether it's through seminars or gurus or YouTube or whatever it is to go out there and, and get a hundred rental units that are all going to cash flow a hundred dollars per door and you'll make $10,000 a month and, and you'll live the good life. And yeah. ironically, that was 2003. I still hear that same sales pitch today with the same numbers. I know, <laughs> but, you know, $10,000 a month today is not what it was in 2003. Doesn't go that far. <laughs> no. Um, so, when when Jeff and I really got into it, you know, we were buying and, and flipping and and you know buying rental properties. Some would keep, some we'd sell. But we were doing it with all private money, 
And we've got to a point where we had more investors, we had more money available than we had deals. Yeah, that's a fun problem to have. <laughs> it, it is, but it's still a problem, right? It is, because, really, because they, they end up leaving eventually. Yeah, you don't around. want your investors to leave. So through that, that process, the first half of my career, I did a terrible job of building a network. And I, I was I call myself a closet investor, right? I, I was doing it, but I wasn't shouting it from the rooftops and telling the whole world what I was doing. Because you had a job and... Right. And, and sometimes, you know, our friends and our family can put pressure on us and, and, you know, they're, they're trying to protect us, even though they don't have any experience whatsoever. So they just don't want you to end up making a mistake or, you know, anything like that. Well, ultimately I made lots of mistakes and it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, although it didn't feel like it in the late two thousands, a lot of what I do today and a lot of the opportunities that I get today are because of all the stuff I went through in 2007, 8, 9, and 10. Um, certainly, we didn't know that would happen back then, but looking back, it, it, it was absolutely a blessing. So we will wrap up the, the story, I guess, as far as the lending side. We, we started to arbitrage, meaning we use our, our, our investors' money and we knew other real estate investors that needed the money that had deals. Okay. And, and we facilitated the loans. Um, and it was, you know, a couple here, two or three once in a while. That has turned into around 20 to 25 a month at this point. That's um, a lot so, more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a full fledged. That's kind our of brokerage business. or um, no, and, and every state is different. And I'm assuming that in Canada, every every territory would be different. But for us, at least where I live, if we're doing commercial loans on non owner occupied properties, we don't have to be licensed. Oh, my. OK, and, yeah, very different. <laughs> yep. And so we're we're very strategic in that we will not lend to somebody on a residence they're going to live in. Uh, we just have different different laws in every state and in, in just the country itself that are consumer protection laws, if it's their personal residence or their homestead. So that's uh, it, it's I started out in, as a construction worker and uh, now I'm a, a a lender and a lot of other things. That's really cool though, and I I like how I mean you went through hardship and difficult times and you've really turned it around. And here you are now almost 20 years later and you're still doing some real estate investing. So something went right. <laughs> so now you're doing a lot, a lot of lending. Do you still own properties or acquire properties or you're we, mostly focused on the lending side? We do. Um, so about two to three properties a month is my goal. Um, so I've got a closing this Friday. I've got one next Wednesday. Uh, wow. You know, we... We, we like to be and we like to tell our clients that we're, we're in the trenches with them, right? Yeah. Like we, we feel like as borrowers come to us, we want to be their lending partner, not just somebody that gives them a loan and waits for them to fail and then takes the property away from them. You know, in fact, we hardly have ever had to take any property away. In, in the last 10 years, we've had to foreclose and take back nine properties, which is extremely low you know, compared to the volume that we do. No, that's so. really good. And are there states where you prefer to invest or are there states where you don't go or? Um, our lending is, is regional. We, we stay in the upper Midwest. We stay in Wisconsin. Uh, our investors come to us from all over the, the country and, and potentially across, you know, the, the uh, borders. But we, we don't feel like it makes sense to go and lend somewhere that we don't have our fingers on the pulse of the market at all times. Yeah. And honestly, if we have to do the, the worst case scenario and take a property back, we're going to just take it and put it into our other company, our acquisition company and go finish it and resell it. Yeah. It makes sense. Cause you know, the market <laughs> and you know, you know, the area. And if you've decided to lend on it, then the deal is good enough in your in your opinion. So it's not like um, it's not a dire situation by any means. 
But what do you think is the number one rule a lender should have? I guess it's what if the the borrower defaults and I end up owning it? Do I want this property? I think that's kind of how I would envision it. If I own it, it's kind of like stock options. Do you want this stock or not? If I want it, that's the worst case. If not, I still make money. So you make money either way. That's 100% correct. Never lend money on something you wouldn't want to own. And yeah, because you may end up owning it. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you follow that rule, it's a win-win. It really is. So do you have some tips and tricks then for people? Because I know a lot of people that do private lending on their own. In Canada, you can't really do some of the, I guess we would call it brokering that you're doing. Here, mm -hmm. it's it's quite legislated, especially in Ontario. Well, most provinces, but in Ontario where I live, you would need licenses. But you can do one-on-one, -on -one, like a private mm -hmm. lender. Um, but number one, like you said, would you like to own the place that you're lending on? Uh, do you have a second tip or trick that you can offer or... Well, it's it's more for the borrowers than the lender. Um, okay. I, I've, I, I truly believe this that and I lived it when I went through our turmoil. You to me, you should do everything in your power to make the lender whole, make them get them their their money back, even if it's after the fact and, and you lose the property. Um, we've had this happen. We, we've had a couple of loans that went bad and it was, you know, the circumstances were, were very strange. I, I mean, things are going to happen in life. Your personal yeah. life is going to affect your business life at some point. It, it's inevitable. It may be catastrophic. It may be very minor, but let's just use a divorce as an example. If, if there's a divorce in the, in the middle of our loan and you know, we end up having to take the property away. If, if as long as those borrowers did everything they could do to work with us, they kept communicating with us and, you know, they, they made us whole. We're going to consider lending to them again in the future. Much, you know, a, a bank would not probably ever look at it that way, but as a private lender, we absolutely will. The worst thing a borrower can do is just stop communicating altogether because your lender doesn't matter if it's a bank or private or hard money or whatever it is at that point we have to do whatever's necessary to protect our investors and you know protect the sources of the money and if there's no communication it means we have to call the attorneys and and take the property away so yeah. that's my advice is to anyone that's that's a borrower you know Get in good communication with your lenders. Stay in communication to the point where over communication may be annoying, but it's better than lack of communication. Yeah, because it's all about relationships. You mentioned earlier that in the beginning you were not doing a good job at networking, but now it sounds like you're doing the opposite. You're really staying in contact with your, your lenders, your borrowers, the pool of money, everybody, because... That's what real estate is all about, really, is is relationships, in my opinion. It's who you know and who knows you and that reputation. Same with tenants. I mean, I prefer a tenant that's going to tell me, OK, I'm going to be late two days. I've had issues. Then someone who just disappears, then, yeah, there's I can't even work with them. They don't communicate. So, And if a tenant says, I'm going to be late by two days and they actually pay you two days later, that's a great tenant. If they say that's they're going to be late two days and they don't pay you for two weeks. Yeah, that's a different story. <laughs> different story. But it's the same. The example goes across the board in, in any business in any country, right? I mean, yeah, that knows no borders. Honesty and, and communication knows no borders. No, exactly. So I heard something before we came on air about a book that you're writing or even two books. Can you tell us? Kind of how, like, did you maybe tell us more, a sneak peek about your books and what's going on? Yeah. And, and spoiler alert, I'm going to give them all away for the electronic version to free to your, your listeners. Um, I, I really had no intentions of writing books and I'm not an author. I'm not a, I shouldn't say I'm an author. I'm, I am an author now, but I'm not a writer. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but I was at a networking event and I met a gentleman named Kyle Wilson and Kyle Wilson is the business partner to a, a pretty famous author and speaker named Jim Rohn. Yes. And so have you heard of Jim Rohn? Yeah, um, quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. So Kyle Wilson and I sat down at lunch and started having a conversation about what I did and kind of my background. And he's putting a this uh, collaboration book together where essentially there's about 25 authors and and we all write a chapter in that book, which was really eye opening to me, I guess, as, as my first try at, at you know authoring anything. Um, and it's not really hard authoring authoring your personal story because you lived it. So that's coming out. It's it's called Next Level. That's coming out at the end of November, early December. Um, Great. I'd love to be able to give that one to your listeners. And two weeks after I met Kyle and decided that I, you know, or agreed to be in that first book, um, I was at another networking event and I met a, uh, a ghostwriter and started talking to her. And she said, well, why don't we write a book yourself, um, which is going to, and I don't have it titled yet. We've got uh, about four chapters left to write. And then we're going into the the editing and, and all that fun stuff. Uh, but it should be out right around the same time frame, uh, late November, early December. It's strictly about the lending business, um, okay. how to how to underwrite loans, what to do from application all the way through closing, through servicing the loan and beyond, um, which is not just designed for people that want to be a lender. It's really, I think, will be eye-opening for borrowers to to know how to have a great relationship with their lender and you know what's their lender expecting. And if you know what the lender is expecting, you can deliver it before they ask for it it sets you apart from everybody um, because I'm assuming it's probably the same way in Canada. 99% of the time you don't give your lender anything until they ask for it. Yes. <laughs> and if you can, if you can have it all in a nice package, at least most of it before the lender asks for it, it just sets you apart. Yeah. I, one of my uh, friends who's a uh, mortgage broker, that's what she says all the time. I love clients that are organized and yep. you can see like all the income tax statements and this and that. Everything's labeled and easy. And then the file, for some reason, ends up at the top. <laughs> it, oh, it becomes a priority. So <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know exactly why. And and it's it's not anything that's, you know, really hard to do. It's, no. It's, people don't really think about it. So, and that goes, even if you're working with banks, I mean, yeah. actually it's probably even more important when you're working with banks. Cause the volume is very different. They get hundreds right. of applications or thousands or. Right. Um, we were talking a little bit before we started recording the differences in interest rates and, you know, kind of comparing the, the increase in rates in, in the United States versus Canada. Um, what, give me your take on, on what's going to happen in Canada. And then I'd, I'd love to give you mine. Yeah. So that's it. I wanted to have your opinion about how to navigate this changing and evolving situation. Uh, actually we're recording this September 6th, September 7th, the bank of Canada is supposed to announce another potential increase in rate or not, maybe status quo. And we've had, I think three three increases one was half a percent then one i think 1.5 i i don't pay that much attention because whatever i bought personally doesn't really matter how much interest is on the deal it still works i mean at 25 i may have some problems there <laughs> but right now we're at like four five it depends on the project up to six so personally I find that people it's affecting the most is people that are buying their houses, their dream homes. That's really hurting them. Uh, the swimming pool is now gone. Uh, the triple car garage is now a single car garage. People are cutting back. And that's kind of what the government here wants us to do is to scale back, maybe make some sound decisions instead of being stretched really thin and buying the biggest house possible at a crazy price. 
So I think it's going to create more consumer savings. A lot of people will go to apartments that would have become homeowners. Uh, it's going to help with the housing crunch as well. We have a big shortage. So a lot of things. I'm not sure the U.S. I read something similar. You guys are still short houses. Um, I think 4.3 million apartments or houses in the next few years. Where I live in Ontario, it's 1.5 million homes that are missing right now. Uh, so I don't even know in 10 years what it's going to look like. Um, and we're only 15 million people. So that's that's insane. So I think this is going to kind of calm down the market. People will make wise decisions and not keep moving every year to a bigger and bigger house. And yeah, and park their money in other countries. That's what's happening so a lot. If with you're the your rates are right around four and a half to five percent right now. Is that what you told me earlier? It depends. It depends if you're buying, getting variable or some people get up to seven percent. It, it depends on your credit rating, credit worthiness. Um, but yeah, I'd say around five. Five is fair right now. And to us right now, it seems high, but it's really not that high compared to what I'm seeing in other countries and things. So what what's a rate of return that investors try and get on their money to try and compare it to what interest rates are on mortgages? What's a good investment return on your money? Yeah, I find under 15 percent, most people are not interested. So then this does eat away at your your rate of return. I mean, I, I like even more than that, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure what what is it like in Wisconsin? Well, that's that's why I was kind of going down that path because I wasn't sure what your answers were. Like, so for us, our mortgage rates have have gone up um, to be a little bit higher than what you guys have. But interestingly enough, when you and I were talking by percentage, your interest rates have gone up by 400, 500 percent. Yeah, Where ours have really gone up. They've they've basically doubled in the last six months. So. I believe the U.S. government is trying to, to do several things, although we have an election coming up in a couple months. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah. So early November. So now our government is throwing some different and stimulus <laughs> money. And, you know, they, they just are trying to pay off people's student loans now and, and starting more turmoil that way. It's very political. Um, so they're trying to kind of disguise, in my opinion, what's going on with the interest rates by giving some people back more money, but it all comes from the taxpayers regardless. Yeah. From a from an interest rate perspective, when I bought my first deal in 2003, I paid about 9% interest on bank financing. Yeah. That went down into the 5 to 6% range, and then the, the markets crashed in 2007, um, you know, we saw 30 year fixed financing get down into the mid 2% range, two and a half ish. And now that's hovering just over five, between five and 6%. So I think it's an opportunity for investors. Um, number one, I don't use banks, so I don't necessarily care what bank interest rates are. Number two, I, I buy properties and keep the bank financing in place. So I, I'm seeing an increase in our volume of, of inbound um, real estate leads. And if I can go and buy them subject to their loan staying in place at two to 3%, I can still cash flow that property yeah. in the upper Midwest, you know, where Wisconsin is. So I don't have a lot of competition in that area, at least where I live. So I look at it as a huge opportunity. Um, what are the median price points in in Ottawa or in your area? That that's the other thing is that's kind of why I think the interest rate went so low is the property values went up so high. I think I don't know the exact statistics, but around eight hundred thousand for a single house is is about kind of an average price now which only two years ago was 500 and just a bit before that, like 300. So in about five years, prices more than doubled. Yeah. 
which is crazy. And that's kind of in part due to that almost 0% interest. People mm -hmm. were affording bigger and bigger and more expensive homes. So, so those people that bought, is the banking industry, or do they give you a, a fixed rate for 30 years or what? what's no. the term? So Canada is very different. So it's amortized over, uh, well, pr principal residences, mostly 25. You can do 30, I think, um, but 25 on average. And then, um, then you get a rate for five years. And then you have to renegotiate every five years. Unlike the US, you lock in and you had 2% for 30 years, man, I'd be... <laughs> I'd be doing a happy dance. My first house was at 0 0.42. So it would have been great. Yeah. So th there's going to be a lot of people in your area in about three or four more years from now. When it comes time for that five year um, renegotiation, as you call it, the likely the property values are going to go down and could go down far enough to where there's not a bank that's going to refinance them. Nope. And people don't qualify anymore to buy their own home. Um, I'm not in a bad situation, but my own house, this is kind of, if I was to go to a bank right now, I don't even qualify to buy it. So mm. yeah, kind of a <laughs> scary situation. But what happens is the mortgage renews automatically. You don't have, you could just let it renew, but you'll get whatever rate you'll get. So we'll see and then if i try to sell it i'm going to be in the same boat with hundreds of thousands of people in a situation where maybe they overpaid i don't know but i don't think i've overpaid it's just you have to keep a, the house longer is there a cap on how high that interest rate can go at that five-year period no there's no limit so it could be 25 hmm. percent. then i'll put it on credit cards <laughs> by that point so or look to private lenders or yeah, or, or buy it cash or something. We'll, we'll find a way, <laughs> yeah. but it's not a good situation for the average consumer. Uh, it's creating a lot of anxiety and I'm seeing it. People are turning to rentals more uh, trying to sell houses. The housing stock is, is growing where there used to be fewer houses available. Now there's a lot more. Uh, we're not seeing that in the apartment building sector, but single homes, duplexes, small multifamily that's sitting on the market a lot longer. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I guess I look at it a little differently. I, I've not had this conversation with, with somebody from Ottawa that's in the business. So uh, the, right now my wheels are turning because I, I love getting creative and I'm trying to figure yeah. out what, what would I do in that scenario? But for for us, you know, I, I had asked you a question I didn't finish answering for for us, we pay our investors a 9% return to use their okay. money. And so the loans that people come to me for, which are all short-term six-month loans, we're charging between 12 and 13.5%. Very um, fair, yeah. Right. Yeah, for short-term, um, you certainly wouldn't want to pay that on a you know a five-year deal. No. <laughs> uh, but for the, the house flippers and the, the landlords that are just trying to uh, stabilize a property and then get long-term financing, it's we're, we're about one and a half to 2% cheaper than, than a lot of our competition, but it does, you know, it, it gives our investors, um, especially earlier on when we were raising money, a lot of them were, were just, uh, you know, an average, citizen that had a good job or a fair job and and they had no way of getting returns more than one or two or three percent they just didn't have the 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 knowledge or the connections no that's so, it so we, we're we're pretty happy that we've been able to change a lot of lives for people a lot of retirement accounts within our uh, our control now and things of that nature no no i love it nine percent is a great number to some people, it may not seem like much, but it's really good because there's a, what is it? The law and investment, the law of 72 or something in seven 72, years, yeah. you, you double your money and stuff. So this falls within those ranges there because mm -hmm. over seven years, well, you, you've done quite a bit um, at increasing your portfolio or your investment. Do you also charge origination fees and other types of fees? We're not used to that in Canada, but... I to our borrowers, yes. Common, to, borrow. yeah, to our borrowers, they pay uh, origination points, and then 
we don't have a, a lot of closing fees. I mean, that's where people can get caught up in the they really as can. A borrower. If they're not comparing apples to apples, as we say down here, um, you know, the interest rate might be completely different or yeah. the interest rate can be identical, but it's the, all the little fine print on the additional fees that can cost a lot of money. Um, we had somebody had approached us and they were refinancing a short term loan and using us to re refinance a different short term loan. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, because the fees were so crazy, they needed to go, uh, get an extension essentially, and the extension fees were like thirty some thousand dollars on a hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan. Ooh, that's it was insane. it was insane. Um, so the fine print it certainly matters. Yeah, it's the same thing here with private funds or bank funds as well. Read the fine prints. Get someone someone honest who will go through everything with you and tell you. Mm -hmm. where what the differences are so you can pick the right product for you so thank you so much Derek time flies uh, if my listeners want to get a hold of you uh, they have money to lend because that's something that's happening quite a bit here um, I guess you may accept Canadian funds or a lot of my listeners have U.S. funds even though they're Canadian what's the best way to reach out to you well um, so my email address which is also how they can get on the list for the free books, the electronic version of the books is simply my first name, Derek at bestreifunding.com. And if you're listening to this and you can't see the text, it's D E R E K at bestreifunding.com. Um, and real quick, if there's anybody interested, we also host the conference on an annual basis. Um, it's an advanced real estate strategies and networking event. That's five days long in Cancun, Mexico, which will be in February of 2023. Yes. Um, and, and that's where a lot of these relationships blossom and grow. So we, we have our conference for five days and the, we have non-selling speakers that come in from nine until one each day. And then from one until through dinner time is just open networking and, and you know, hanging out with, with your new friends. And then we have these town hall sessions in the evening, which are, um, there, I mean, it's all, you can go to as much or as little as you want, right? It's optional. What I really love about it though, is we encourage people to bring their children, especially if they're 10 and older, we don't charge you to, to have your child, um, attend the conferences. If they want to sit in on all the lectures, they can, but it's, it's really about the kids building a network themselves of other kids who have parents that are you know entrepreneurs and unique like us so that's why we call it the generations of wealth it's uh gowvoyage.com gowvoyage.com and uh i'd love to love to fill up cancun mexico with canadians It'd be great yeah that'd be really cool wow and how much is it on average for to attend it's a it's a 9.99 um conference price and it's at an all-inclusive you got to pay for your all-inclusive but yeah um, oh well that's very reasonable yeah it's honestly and i'll be 100 percent real with your with your group um we don't profit off the conference no i know all the work that goes into those <laughs> it's crazy um but what do we get out of it we get the we get the relationships and yeah and that's those, worth a lot that's worth a lot so I appreciate you having me on this show talking about relationships. It's, it's been awesome just getting to know you and kind of going back and forth a little bit, comparing our two countries and how we do stuff. Yes. No, I, I learn every day. I love it. And thank you so much. And we'll have to catch up maybe uh, after your book launch, maybe late in 2023 and find out how it's been and what you're up to and see where things are. So thanks a lot and all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Hey there, listeners. We hope you enjoyed this latest episode of the Wine and Real Estate Podcast. Yes, absolutely. You can find us on Instagram. Our handle is wine underscore and underscore real estate. So wine and real estate on Facebook, FL Homes Corp. And you can also find us on our YouTube channel. 
Yes, and please make sure to give us a rating, five stars, mm -hmm. or any comments. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, we love suggestions as well. Cheers. Yeah, chin chin. Thank you.